Bom, boa tarde a todos, a todas. É, eu peço desculpas pelo atraso de meia hora aqui em relação à programação, é, mas tenho o prazer de anunciar que a nossa sessão completa com quatro palestrantes. Eu vou mudar aqui para o inglês. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this session. Professor Yasuda is going to start talking about cognitive reserve, reserve in Down syndrome. And then uh, Dr. Luciana Mascarenhas Fonseca from Washington State University to talk about intra-individual cognitive variability in aging adults with Down syndrome. Uh, Matheus Aranha, who is from this school but is presently in Barcelona, uh, is going to speak about the mental Down syndrome, clinical and imaging findings. And finally, Professor Annie Tellerberg from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, to talk about Alzheimer's disease biomarkers in Down syndrome. Monica, please welcome. Thank you. Um, hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Professor Juarez just has asked, asked me to speak in English, so I will address you in English. Okay, I hope you you can understand my accent. Um, so uh, I was given a very difficult topic, um, and I was very excited about looking into cognitive reserve and Down syndrome. But then I was in panic because uh, I didn't find very much in the literature and I started um, asking colleagues like uh, Luciana, Livia, and, and I found out that indeed there is very little published uh, thus far. So please see this uh, talk as a work in progress, as some, some, a field that's going to um, develop very quickly, that's for sure. So this is the context. Um, we now have, uh, fortunately, a large number of people without syndrome um, becoming old, getting into their 60s, 70s sometimes. So this is really an opportunity. This is really fantastic. Um, on the other hand, we, we have seen today that there is a very high prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in this, uh, this group. Uh, especially when they reach uh, their 40s or their 50s. I've seen several studies indicating that 55 is a critical age um, for the clinical manifestation of the, the, the disease. And uh, I've also seen uh, several papers uh, indicating that now Down syndrome can also be understood as a form of genetic Alzheimer's disease, so really transforming the field of Alzheimer's disease uh, itself. Uh, so this is a brief outline for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to present the, the new framework that's been recently published to discuss cognitive reserve. Uh, I'm also going to uh, very briefly summarize findings from, about cognitive reserve in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, very few tentative findings about cognitive reserve in Down syndrome. I'm going to mention Livia's uh, work in progress and uh, the implications for this field for care and for research. Um, so the, the, the idea of cognitive reserve is really a fascinating one. Um, and it's been around for several decades now. And resilience is indeed, and I'm going to mention, I'm, I'm using for this talk, the, the new framework uh, that's the outcome of this collaboratory on research definitions for reserve and resilience in cognitive aging and dementia that has been funded by the NIA, uh, established in 2019, so it's, it's been going on for a couple of years now. And, uh, and this group of specialists has come to the conclusion that the, the, the higher uh, concept is resilience. So resilience refers to the maintained cognition and function in the presence of aging and disease. And this collaboratory, this effort to harmonize terms and procedures was necessary because several researchers were using different terms and different methods to study cognitive reserve. Uh, so I, I think this is indeed a really good contribution. Uh, so under this uh, broader idea of resilience, we have mechanisms 
three mechanisms that may uh, reflect this uh, notion of resilience. Cognitive reserve itself, uh, which is understood as cognitive performance uh, when it's better than expected, considering the degree of age, related brain changes, injury or disease. So if you know the person is um, in advanced age or has a specific disease, but the performance of the person uh, is outstanding and is not expected for that condition, uh, then we suspect that there may be uh, that person may have cognitive reserve. Brain maintenance refers to the absence of change in neural resources or neuropathologies um, and determinants of reserve cognition. So we are going to use brain maintenance when the person maintains a very healthy brain um, into old age. And we also have the concept of brain reserve, um, which is a more biological concept. It refers to a neurobiological status of the brain uh, at any time. So uh, people may be said to have brain reserve if they have larger brains or a uh, larger number of neurons or more synapses. So it would be an anatomical advantage. Um, and our reference in this field has been for many years Professor Jakob Stern, and this is probably one of his most famous and uh, published and uh, reprinted graphs. Uh, and here we can see, uh, do I have a pointer? Maybe I can use the, the cursor. It should be okay. So here we can have, um, here we are plotting neuropathology and cognitive scores, so cognitive performance. So we can see that people that have low cognitive reserve, they will start to decline uh, earlier, earlier on, uh, considering the same level of neuropathology uh, compared to people with high reserve. So example, for example, if we get this turning point here for people with low reserve, um, and we consider, sorry, what have I done? Uh, I have to go back, is there a way? Yes. Oh, okay. So if you consider the same level of neuropathology, you can see that people with high reserve, they're going to develop uh, cognitive problems later on. So they are going to be able to, to live um, with, the, uh, with, with the, um, a certain amount of neuropathology without showing any clinical signs of dementia for a longer period of time. Um, so this is something that uh, Jakob's, uh, uh, Jakob Stern's definition for cognitive reserve in the very beginning of this view. So uh, he said, he wrote, it speaks of an active process that allows some people to cope with more brain pathology than others before cognitive abilities are affected. So um, brain reserve would be a passive kind of reserve and cognitive reserve would be an, an active form of reserve. And, uh, and this all started, for example, this is a study um, from 1993, if I'm not mistaken, um, where a when they followed uh, 139 uh, residents, 85 years and older, who donated their brains. And in this particular study, they, they identified 10 individuals who had a significant amount of AD uh, pathology. However, they were in the highest uh, cognitive performance quintile. So they were performing really well, although they had significant amount of pathology. So this is when this hypothesis, this idea of cognitive reserve um, comes up. In the 90s, although uh, Blessed and colleagues back in the 60s had already um, discussed something similar. So uh, these are the, the, the new definitions, the, um, the operational definitions for cognitive reserve, for assessing and studying cognitive reserve according to the new framework that was published this year. So uh, this, this group of specialists, they have concluded that we need three variables to study cognitive reserve. We need to have measures of brain changes, of insults, uh, lesions, um, so some, some parameter that indicates uh, changes in the brain. We also need measures of changes in cognition. Um, and we also need a variable that may influence the relationship between 
the, the measures one and two. So we, we need to look for variables that, that are going to moderate the relationship between brain changes and cognitive performance. So here on the other side, on the, the right side, you know, we have some uh, possibilities. So let's see if I can move this up. Okay, brain volume, uh, white matter integrity, biomarkers for an AD or for vascular dementia. Uh, for number two, we, we could use all kinds of uh, cognitive measures that should be affected by um, brain changes. For example, vocabulary is usually a measure of pre-morbid intelligence may be affected later on, wouldn't be a good candidate, but episodic memory would be a very good one. Um, and potential variables for assessing cognitive reserve would be based on endowment or experience. For example, IQ, education, occupational complexity, amount of leisure activities, um, the density of social networks. These are some of the variables that have been used as proxy measures for cognitive reserve. Uh, so now, um, after this publication, so the, this uh, group of experts are asking researchers to look at uh, at least these uh, three variables um, to study cognitive reserve. I'm trying to go ahead and see. Um, uh, no. Uh, no. Um, but in, uh, it has not always been like this. I mean, we have a lot of studies uh, investigating cognitive reserve without brain measures. And, and these are some of, uh, these are very uh, frequently cited studies. Uh, they are usually epidemiological studies that have uh, actually found that these, these were the first studies to support the notion of uh, cognitive reserve. These were epidemiological studies carried out in several places indicating that um, higher cognitive performance, uh, slower cognitive decline, lower risk for AD were associated to variables such as higher education, obvious occupational performance, high involvement in intellectual and social activities, high IQ. So actually, uh, the epidemiological studies, uh, they, they indeed give a lot of uh, strength to this view because we could see that participants who had these characteristics, they had very positive, more positive outcomes than, than people who did not have those characteristics. But according to the new framework, uh, we need to conduct studies that are more similar to this one. Uh, this is, these are findings for the Eclipse uh, study, that's, uh, this was published uh, in 2010. Uh, and, and in this Eclipse, it's kind of a consortium. Um, the data from three neuropathological studies were put together, and they were able to see, and this is an European study, and they were able to assess uh, several kinds of neuropathological insults. And here in, in this uh, picture on the right, I, I have the data for cortical atrophy. And they separated uh, they, they also identified the percentage, percentage of people who had donated their, brain, their brains who had actually developed dementia and looking at the three studies altogether, 56% uh, of participants had clinical manifestations of dementia. Uh, but as you can see here, the, the clinical manifestation was very much influenced by uh, the level of education. So in the, in the red line, we have uh, moderate or severe cortical atrophy. In the orange line, we have mild cortical atrophy. And in the green line, we have no evidence of cortical atrophy. But we can see that the percentage of dementia changes according to the level of education. So, for example, if you look at people who are uh, four or seven, 
that there is a very dramatic difference in terms of percentage of dementia according to the degree of uh, cortical atrophy. So this is the kind of study that uh, the, the new framework on cognitive reserve is, is suggesting because we are looking at brain changes, uh, cognitive manifestations, but we are also looking at variables that are um, changing this relationship, as is the case here with education. So this, uh, this study um, ended up concluding that higher education did not necessarily protect people's brains, but um, actually attenuated the, the effects of uh, neuropathology, uh, affecting therefore the, the amount of uh, dementia, the degree that the number of people who actually developed dementia. Um, so, how about, um, I am sorry because we can't see the, 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 the topics uh, up there because of the, the bar. Um, how about cognitive reserve in Down syndrome? Uh, in one of uh, Stern's most re uh, recent uh, articles, he, he has a, a paragraph which reads like this, although this discussion of cognitive reserve has focused on aging and dementia, undoubtedly we have a large amount of studies in this field, the concept of cognitive reserve is applicable to any condition that affects the brain. So it can be studied in multiple sclerosis, in stroke, traumatic brain injury, and, and why not in, um, in Down syndrome? Um, but as I said in, in the very first minutes, we have very few studies touching on this topic. Um, sample sizes are super small, and they do not follow the new framework that are investigating brain changes, cognitive reserve, and cognition. And, and the strategies used so, so far are limited to correlations between the amount of leisure activities people carry out and cognitive performance. There is only one study about that. And there is one uh, study developing a mathematical model uh, based on confirmatory factor analysis to um, really try to understand what would be cognitive reserve in DS. Uh, and this is the, the first study. This study, the study was conducted in Israel uh, with 32 adults with non-specific um, ID and uh, some had um, Down syndrome from 25 to 55 years old and they had to raise their participation on leisure activities. Um, this was an interesting effort because they um, classified a uh, list, a uh, wide list of um, leisure activities into recreational stimulating activities, which would be less cognitive demanding, like cooking or dancing. We know that this is kind of fragile because uh, who would say that cooking is simple? Uh, this was based on judges who had to list the amount of cognitive uh, abilities that were involved in the, um, in the, in the leisure activity. Um, but still, this is very subjective, and uh, activities such as dancing and cooking, they can be extremely uh, complex and, and stimulating. But anyway, they divided the, the, the activities into recreational, that were supposed to be less demanding, and the cognitively stimulating ones, which were supposed to involve several cognitive components, like reading, taking courses, etc. They had a, a large list of uh, cognitive tasks, and by means of hierarchical hierarchical regressions, including mental age, chronological age, and the two uh, measures of uh, activities, they found that the uh, recreational activities did explain a significant portion of the variance in verbal fluency, and the activities that were more challenging they significantly explain the variance of most of the cognitive tests used. So this is one of the, the only studies we have um, suggesting this relationship that doing uh, leisure activities may be, um, may favor cognitive performance or perhaps protect the brain. This is an inference as we do not have any um, measures for that. And this is the other study which is a more mathematical approach. Uh, and this is an interesting idea. This is something that I had never thought before reading two articles for this talk, that maybe cognitive reserve may not be measurable completely. 
Uh, and it may be a variable that's more of a latent variable. You know that, it, that it, 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 it exists, but you can't measure it or observe it directly. Um, and this is an interesting idea. So we may need more variables to compose what we would call a latent variable that's expressed by means of others, right? So, um, and in one of the papers, uh, this researcher, Richard Jones, he divides this idea of a latent model, uh, latent variable for cognitive reserve into for perhaps a formative model, but maybe we have a reflective model. Um, so uh, cognitive reserve and other characteristics would be influenced by other variables. And this is the, the proposal of this um, group of researchers from Spain. Um, the data was collected in Mexico and in Spain, and they devised this uh, theoretical idea. Uh, and apparently the data they had for 35 persons with Down syndrome from 16 to 35 years old using 12 variables had a very good mathematical fit. So they are proposing in this paper that cognitive reserve in Down syndrome specifically uh, could be thought of as uh, composed by personal conditions, quality of life, cognitive outcomes, and also physical activity. So it would be um, cognitive re reserve would be um, reflected by these other variables. It's a very interesting idea uh, to start working with uh, models such as this one, with larger data sets. Um, they, they were very much worried about missing data and they also proposed and test strategies for data imputation when you have a small sample, but uh, this is the model they, they are proposing. Um, this is Livia's, I also wanted to mention Livia's uh, master's project. And uh, I, I believe that Livia's work will be the very first one in Brazil and maybe in the world to, to have a more, um, uh, a more, how could I say this, a study specifically designed to study cognitive reserve. And her general aim is to assess the relationship between the exposure to um, simulation programs and cognitive outcomes among people uh, with Down syndrome at João Clemente Institute. And the specific aim is also to assess the relationships between clinical, social, social demographic, and cognitive variables. And this uh, master's project is uh, advised oriented, well, advised by Professor Orestes Forleza. And this is a slide that Livia shared with me. For, for this talk, and she plans to conduct, she's actually conducting already, right, a cross-sectional study. Uh, for inclusion criteria, she's going to include protocols of participants at Jo Clemente, who have been there for at least 10 years, who should be older than 25, 25 or older, and she's not going to use the data if the protocols are not very explicit about entry and exit from the institution information uh, or if they have a lot of missing data about activity records. Uh, so she's analyzing, she's doing a massive, conducting a massive work uh, analyzing protocols and she's going to correlate this information regarding the uh, participation in uh, cognitive simulation programs and their cognitive performance now. So it's going to be uh, really fabulous to see if there is indeed an association um, between um, the intensity and participation in such programs and, uh, and cognitive performance. Um, now, very quickly, I'm just uh, finishing up. What are the implications for this kind of study uh, for care and for research? So, why is it important to, to assess? to try to assess cognitive uh, reserve in Down syndrome. Because if, if we understand that people who have higher reserve uh, may have a slower rate of cognitive decline due to higher cognitive reserve, uh, we may have different ideas about their prognosis, for example. If we know they have very high reserve, we, we may expect them to decline later on. If they have lower re re reserve, we may expect them to re decline sooner. Uh, 
So, so the, the, uh, such an assessment would have implications for disease management and care. For research, it's a nice idea, uh, Jakob Stern has put this in one of his papers, that we should assess cognitive reserve and use it as a variable for randomization. If you're testing a new drug, you don't want to have one of your groups with, a, with very high cognitive reserve and the other group with very low cognitive reserve. So we should try to assess it and also use it as a parameter that has to be counterbalanced. Um, but most importantly, we, we have to start to think what kind of interventions can be designed uh, to increase cognitive reserve along the life cycle so that people with Down syndrome can remain um, cognitively uh, preserved and functionally active the, the longest they can. So the, the, the reserve concept also has implications for interventions because we want to build reserve not only in infancy but in, in the adult life as well. So conclusions, possible tentative preliminary conclusions. Uh, cognitive reserve has attracted a lot of attention and funding in the field of cognitive aging and dementia and I think this group of specialists said they were funded for three years by the NIA, so th there is a lot of interest in identifying the uh, markers of reserve uh, for the reasons I have mentioned earlier, not only for Down syndrome, but for the population in general. Um, as it may offer insights into what can be done to delay loss of cognition and dependence, uh, in, in the DS field, it's, in, it's, in, it's a very, very early infancy. There's a lot to be done in, in this area. Uh, and future studies, I, I put here larger samples, but I forgot to say that ideally the study should be longitudinal. And we should follow people up for, for perhaps a decade. Um, we should make efforts to, to gather larger samples, going beyond 30, 35, um, for, considering what we have now. We should include markers of neuropathologies, uh, for example, structural, functional, molecular, neuroimaging, CSF markers for ID, among other things that could be measured, uh, comprehensive cognitive evaluations. Uh, Livia and I were discussing that we have very few cognitive measures uh, properly validated, so that's a challenge as well. And we should investigate potential proxies for cognitive reserve. Maybe they are different in Down syndrome. Maybe it, it doesn't um, go down to education, professional complexity. Maybe there are other things. And um, interventions to delay cognitive uh, decline and functional decline um, in Down syndrome should consider the findings from this research that has yet to be done. So thank you very much for inviting me and for the opportunity to participate and follow all the very interesting uh, lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mari, for this wonderful presentation. We're going to take questions at the end of the session. So now we're going to move to Luciana's presentation about cognitive intangible viability in cognition. Please, Luciana. Boa tarde é, a vocês. É um imenso prazer para mim estar aqui uh, participando desse workshop que marca um momento importante da, é, da pesquisa em síndrome de Down no Brasil. Uh, bom, a fim de é, transparência, minha, minha pesquisa ultimamente tem sido, uh, meus estudos têm sido financiados pela Alzheimer Association e pelo National Institute of Aging. Uh, Aqui o conteúdo da minha apresentação hoje, então eu vou começar falando um pouquinho sobre a visão geral do meu percurso é, na, na pesquisa com síndrome de Down e, e depois uh, falar um panorama geral uh, sobre essa pesquisa. Bom, então, uh, antes de começar a pesquisa, né, antes de, de apresentar a pesquisa, eu queria uh, contar uh, brevemente meu percurso de trabalho em síndrome de Down uh, e demência aqui no Brasil nos dias atuais. É, minha formação sempre foi voltada para uh, demência para a população geral, é, mas em 2010 eu fui convidada, fui contratada pela PAI de São Paulo, é, pelo atual, que é atual Instituto Jo Clemente, né, junto com toda uma nova equipe especializada em gerontologia, é, para prestar serviços voltados para os desafios de envelhecimento de pessoas com deficiência intelectual. 
E, e foi esse trabalho clínico que, com pessoas com síndrome de Down que me fez me apaixonar por esse trabalho com essa população e também direcionou a, a minha carreira de pesquisadora que eu sigo até hoje. Então, na época, é, era nítido que muitos dos meus pacientes com síndrome de Down que envelheciam, eles apresentavam mudança de comportamento atípica, é, porém ainda não havia no Brasil instrumentos para avaliação da demência em pessoas com deficiência intelectual que pudessem auxiliar o diagnóstico é, e a intervenção. Né? Então, foi a partir dessa essa demanda que em 2014, com a orientação do, do professor Cássio Botino, eu iniciei meu doutorado nessa área. Então, como parte do, do meu doutorado, que foi financiado pela FAPESP, é, nós validamos o primeiro instrumento para avaliação da demência em adultos com síndrome de Down no Brasil, que, foi, que é o CANDEX DS, é, e nós investigamos os sinais iniciais de demência nessa população. Bom, de lá para cá, eu tive dois filhos, há cinco anos moro nos Estados Unidos, tenho trabalhado com envelhecimento e demência em populações minoritárias e mantenho algumas pesquisas é, com síndrome de Down e demência através da minha parceria com uh, o professor Forlença na USP, né, e com orientação de alguns alunos de graduação, de pós-graduação. É, então, por fim, eu gostaria de dizer que eu estou muito animada com a oportunidade de voltar a trabalhar mais diretamente com a população com síndrome de Down e com a pesquisa no Brasil, através desse projeto que eu venho apresentar para vocês hoje. É, e que é sobre variabilidade cognitiva intra-individual em adultos com síndrome de Down e as associações com biomarcadores plasmáticos de Alzheimer, neuropatologia e diagnóstico clínico. Como já foi explorado nas aulas anteriores, é, a gente sabe que há uma associação genética entre a trissomia do 21 e o desenvolvimento prematuro dos aspectos neuropatológicos da doença de Alzheimer em pessoas com síndrome de Down. É, estudos pós-mortem e de neuroimagem mostram que a partir dos 40 anos, praticamente todos os indivíduos com síndrome de Down apresentam sinais neuropatológicos da doença de Alzheimer. Esse link, ele, esse link genético ele é parcialmente explicado pela presença da terceira cópia do cromossomo 21 na síndrome de Down, que resulta na expressão excessiva de algumas proteínas e, dentre elas, é, a proteína percussora do amiloide no cérebro. Devido à incidência que é extremamente alta da patologia da doença de Alzheimer em indivíduos com síndrome de Down, eles são considerados uma população alvo ideal para ensaios de terapia contra a doença de Alzheimer, seja anti-amiloide como anti-tal. É, no entanto, ainda que apresente a neuropatologia da doença de Alzheimer, nem todos os indivíduos com síndrome de Down desenvolvem a demência. E ainda não se sabe ao claro é, qual, por que, que alguns toleram uma alta carga de deposição amiloide com pouco ou até nenhum efeito nas funções cognitivas, né? Por fim, atualmente não há medidas cognitivas que sejam capazes de identificar o início da demência nessa população. Bom, variabilidade cognitiva intraindividual é a variabilidade no desempenho de uma pessoa e medidas cognitivas que são administradas num único momento ou num curto período de, de tempo, então vamos dizer meses ou dias, né? É, é um conceito diferente da abordagem convencional para comparar o nível médio de desempenho entre grupos de indivíduos, né? A maioria dos profissionais de saúde em geriatria está tá ciente das flutuações impressionantes que podem acontecer é, na funcionalidade de, funcionalidade de um paciente com Alzheimer, né, ou com demência, é no mesmo dia, e, e essa flutuação ela é particularmente acentuada durante o início da demência, né, então é comum que membros da, das famílias é, contem que o paciente não consegue reconhecer o filho ou encontrar o caminho para o banheiro na própria casa, e poster, posteriormente, ainda no mesmo dia, o paciente reconhece todo mundo e parece estar bem orientado, né, é, esse aqui é um diagrama hipotético, ele contrasta as rápidas flutuações situações né, é, cognitivas e funcionais em cinza, com o declínio neurológico geral mais gradual e prolongado em verde. É, e a, a variabilidade cognitiva intraindividual, ela pode servir é, como um indicador comportamental de danos neurológicos e está associada a disfunções de rede relacionadas a processos neurodegenerativos. Só para ficar um pouco mais claro, o conceito da variabilidade cognitiva intraindividual segue aqui um exemplo breve, né? Então, vamos dizer que nós avaliamos a performance de um participante com diversos testes neuropsicológicos, né? Por exemplo, vamos dizer que a gente usou o RAVLT, o, o teste do relógio e memória lógica do VAIS, né? É, para estimar a variabilidade cognitiva, primeiro, as pontuações brutas são padronizadas para que a gente possa comparar e a variabilidade intrapessoal nas pontuações dos testes ela é calculada pelo desvio padrão daquele indivíduo. 
Então, entendemos o quanto que a performance daquele participante sofre maior ou menor variação, né? Vamos dizer que o participante com maior variabilidade individual, intraindividual, ele vai muito bem em alguns dos testes e muito mal em outros. É, a gente sabe que a cognição pode variar, né, devido a, a, a diversos fatores fisiológicos e ambientais, e alguma variação é não só normal, mas esperada, né? Porém, a variação de desempenho que é acentuada, ela poderia indicar, então, essa disfunção, né? Então, quanto maior a dispersão ou inconsistência entre a performance dos testes, maior o risco de processos é, degenerativos. É, bom, a partir de agora, é, para facilitar a minha apresentação e também para cansar menos os ouvidos de vocês, eu vou me referir ao termo variabilidade cognitiva apenas como é, o termo de variabilidade cognitiva intraindividual, só como variabilidade cognitiva, tá? Mas eu estou me referindo à variabilidade cognitiva intraindividual. É só para facilitar mesmo. Bom, recentemente, os estudos sobre a utilidade da variabilidade cognitiva como um marcador sensível para alterações pré-clínicas da doença de, al de Alzheimer, elas têm mostrado resultados promissores. Né? Estudos longitudinais demonstram que a variabilidade cognitiva transversal, num único momento, ela pode ser um marcador cognitivo sensível de comprometimento cognitivo precoce relacionado à demência para a população em geral. Então, com uma análise longitudinal né, também. E como uma assinatura de declínio precoce na integridade neurológica, a variabilidade cognitiva ela é considerada um novo marcador é, não invasivo, de baixo custo e alternativo. Né? É, maior variabilidade cognitiva tem sido associada à disfunção cognitiva em estudos transversais e com o subsequente desenvolvimento da demência em idosos, é, sendo apontado como um marcador efetivo até 10 anos antes do aparecimento dos primeiros sintomas. É, e vários estudos tem, é, também sugerem essa ligação entre a variabilidade cognitiva marcada em um tempo e o declínio cognitivo longitudinal. Uh, diversos estudos mostram também que a variabilidade cognitiva medida nesse único tempo, ela se correlaciona com o biomarcador de líquor, coletado por punção lombar, lombar seja para comprometimento cognitivo leve como para doença de Alzheimer, é, com maior deposição cerebral do beta-amiloide, é, com perdas estruturais no cérebro, com danos nos córtices frontais e também com atrofia cerebral regional. Uh, no entanto, poucos estudos investigaram variabilidade cognitiva em grupos específicos ou populações minoritárias, e, e não se sabe hoje se a apresentação da, da demência e biomarcadores da doença de Alzheimer podem estar relacionados especificamente à, à variabilidade cognitiva em população com síndrome de Down. É, de alguns estudos preliminares que deram suporte às nossas hipóteses nesse estudo, então, do primeiro estudo em variabilidade cognitiva em população indígena norte-americana, utilizando medida transversal de ressonância magnética estrutural, maior variabilidade cognitiva na memória foi associada a um menor volume do hipocampo, porém essa associação deixou de ser significativa depois do ajuste pela média da performance nos mesmos testes. Numa outra investigação do nosso grupo, examinando variabilidade cognitiva em participantes com comprometimento cognitivo leve e diabetes tipo 1, é, os participantes com comprometimento eles tiveram maior variabilidade cognitiva é, medidos pela, pelos domínios do teste MOCA. É, e num outro trabalho recente, também com adultos com, com diabetes tipo 1, esse é um estudo que é financiado pela Alzheimer Association sobre biomarcadores plasmáticos da doença de Alzheimer e a variabilidade cognitiva medida por avaliação ecológica momentânea. Então, essa avaliação é uma avaliação da performance que ela foi feita três vezes ao dia durante dez dias através do uso de um aparelho é, celular, né? então um aplicativo ligado a um, a um, um celular dos participantes. É, e todos os biomarcadores plasmáticos incluídos estiveram relacionados com variabilidade cognitiva em todos os determinados domínios cognitivos, mesmo quando controlado por performance média nos testes. É, esses dados são dados que ainda estão saindo do forno. Em população com síndrome de Down, nós levamos em consideração dois estudos anteriores do nosso grupo que indicam que indivíduos com síndrome de Down podem apresentar declínio na memória e na função executiva, bem como alteração comportamental, como os indicadores de demência em estágio inicial. Bom, com essa pesquisa, é, a gente espera determinar uh, o quanto a variabilidade cognitiva, sozinha ou em combinação com outros biomarcadores, se relaciona com a patologia da doença de Alzheimer e com a expressão clínica da demência em adultos com síndrome de Down. 
O objetivo primário da proposta é caracterizar as relações entre a variabilidade cognitiva, os biomarcadores da doença de Alzheimer e a expressão da demência em adultos com síndrome de Down. Nossa hipótese geral é que em adultos com síndrome de Down a variabilidade cognitiva esteja associada a biomarcadores relacionados à doença de Alzheimer e que possa prever o início da demência. Né? A nossa premissa científica é de que o uso da variabilidade cognitiva, é, da variabilidade cognitiva possa permitir uma melhor precisão de risco, né? então com isso permitir também o início precoce de é, intervenções para mitigar o efeito da doença, influenciar decisões importantes de gerenciamento, tratamento e monitoramento da doença, né? além de facilitar a inclusão desses, dessas pessoas em ensaios clínicos contra a doença de Alzheimer. É, essa figura ela mostra um diagrama hipotético das nossas hipóteses, né, da nossa hipótese central, na qual a variabilidade cognitiva ela pode servir como um marcador pré-clínico de demência em adultos com síndrome de Down. Então, aqui nessa figura, a transição é, de cognitivamente estável para prodrômico e de prodrômico para demência, elas estão posicionadas em aproximadamente, aí na parte de baixo, 50 e 55 anos de idade, que representam as tendências mostradas por estudos epidemiológicos com pessoas com síndrome de Down. Né? Esse traço laranja ele seria a variabilidade cognitiva ao longo da vida, né, em relação aos outros biomarcadores da doença de Alzheimer em pessoas com síndrome de Down especificamente. Então a gente espera que a variabilidade cognitiva ela não seja linear, ela começa é, com um, uma maior magnitude durante a adolescência, diminui durante o início da idade adulta e volta a sofrer um aumento sutil ao longo da vida adulta e envelhecimento normal, porém é, com um aumento significativo antes no início da manifestação da demência. Né? À, à medida que a demência progride, todas as funções cognitivas vão declinando e com isso a variabilidade cognitiva também volta a diminuir, já que todas as funções estão comprometidas igualmente. É, no nosso primeiro objetivo, a gente... Uh, vai examinar se a variabilidade cognitiva está associada a biomarcadores plasmáticos da doença de Alzheimer, então beta-amiloide 4240, pital 217 neurofilamento, e, e a patologia relacionada à doença de Alzheimer medida por marcadores de amiloide tal por PET-scan. É, nós também examinaremos se a variabilidade cognitiva está associada à apresentação clínica da demência ou declínio cognitivo. E esses dados, eles serão críticos para otimizar o desenho de um novo estudo que testará as medidas dos resultados dos nossos objetivos 1 e 2 numa, numa nova coorte transcultural e mais diversificada que envolve adultos com síndrome de Down. É, além disso, a gente pretende fazer uma comparação também com um grupo com doença de Alzheimer autossômica dominante, devido à sua similaridade com a síndrome de Down, no que concerne a deposição precoce do beta-amiloide na região estriatal do cérebro. Então, a doença de Alzheimer autossômica dominante é uma forma é, da doença de Alzheimer, porém, uma forma hereditária, rara e de início precoce, é, que começa antes dos 60 ou até dos 50 anos de idade. <risos> Bom, esse projeto inclui dois estudos ao longo de um total de cinco anos. A primeira parte, que é o estudo 1, um, ele envolve análise secundária dos dados do ABCDS, que é um estudo multicêntrico longitudinal que envolve oito universidades dos Estados Unidos e a Universidade de Cambridge, na Inglaterra. A segunda parte, é, ela envolve uma nova coorte transcultural mais diversificada de adultos com síndrome de Down, que está dividida em dois grupos. Um no estado de Washington, nos Estados Unidos, com foco no, no recrutamento de grupos raciais minoritários com síndrome de Down, e outro em São Paulo, através da nossa parceria com o professor Forlense e o Laboratório de Síndrome de Down e Envelhecimento do IPQ. Uh, o grupo com é, doença de Alzheimer autossômica dominante, ele vai ser constituído através da nossa parceria com o professor Ansis, da Universidade de Washington, em São Luís, e a Diane, que é a maior corte de indivíduos com essa forma rara de demência. Uh, Para que essa pesquisa aconteça, eu tenho a sorte de contar com um time de mentores extraordinário, é, tenho sete mentores, todos eles de peso em todas as áreas relacionadas a essa pesquisa, com seis instituições universitárias envolvidas, entre três países, Estados Unidos, Brasil e Inglaterra, e dentre eles, a Universidade de São Paulo, através do, do professor é, Forlença e do Laboratório de Síndrome de Down. Aqui é possível ver a apresentação do estudo 1, um, com a divisão dos objetivos por fase de estudo, as amostras, medidas utilizadas e a organização dos resultados esperados, nós já temos a aprovação oficial do ABCDS 
para iniciar esse estudo 1, envolvendo dados de 300 participantes com síndrome de Down, que tinham de 37 a, a 53 anos de idade durante a linha de base, e, e eles têm três segmentos é, no intervalo de 18 meses cada. Todos os participantes eles têm dados de avaliação neuropsicológica detalhada, investigação de diagnóstico de demência, além da análise de neuroimagem, é, PET para beta-amiloide e tal, é, e análise plasmática, é, incluindo o beta-amiloide 4240, o PITAL 217 e também o neurofilamento. É, o estudo 2, ele será um estudo transversal, examinando as medidas de resultado estabelecidas durante o, o estudo 1, um. é, será realizado em dois locais, então, no Laboratório de Envelhecimento e Síndrome de Down do IPQ e aqui no estado de Washington. É, um esforço vai ser feito particularmente no estado de Washington para incluir um número máximo de participantes de minorias étnicas e raciais, incluindo engajamento prioritário com a comunidade latina e com índios norte-americanos. É, o uso da variabilidade cognitiva, em vez de pontuações de testes cognitivos individuais, ele permitirá essa comparação com a coorte da doença de Alzheimer autossômica dominante, é, que usa uma bateria de testes com medidas e domínios semelhantes. Né? Então, a gente espera ter as mesmas, os mesmos biomarcadores plasmáticos de doença de Alzheimer e de imagem para serem testadas nessa nova coorte. Em, em todas as coortes, na verdade. Né? Bom, dentre os pontos fortes dessa pesquisa estão que o trabalho proposto visa identificar formas menos dispendiosas e menos invasivas de predizer o aparecimento de demência e sinais de neurodegeneração em pessoas com síndrome de Down, o que pode auxiliar na intervenção precoce, né, reduzir o impacto da demência para os indivíduos com síndrome de Down, para as famílias e para as comunidades, é, e por ser uma medida de baixo custo e relativamente fácil administração, é, pode beneficiar é, em, em particular os usos em, em o uso em regiões de baixa renda, países em desenvolvimento e zonas rurais. Bom, além disso, o ABCDS é uma das maiores e mais completas cortes de adultos com síndrome de Down, e a gente vai poder aprender com eles para poder aplicar a nova corte que inclui o Brasil. Até onde a gente sabe, o, estado, o estudo 1 ele é o primeiro, né? <risos> a investigar variabilidade cognitiva em indivíduos com síndrome de Down, e além disso, uma potencialidade está no esforço proposto de inclusão de minorias étnicas e raciais, é, o que nem sempre acontece em pesquisas científicas. É, algumas possíveis dificuldades e alternativas, então, primeiro, é, o estudo 2 é limitado em parte pelo resultado do... do, do é, obtido durante o estudo 1, um, né? É, se a nossa hipótese principal não se comprovar, é, a variabilidade cognitiva não se mostrar efetiva né, na predição da demência nessa população, é, a gente tem algumas abordagens alternativas é, analisando outras combinações de pontuações e domínios de testes cognitivos do estudo 1 para aplicar na nova corte no estudo 2. Uh, nós concordamos que existem algumas diferenças importantes entre as três cortes propostas para o estudo. Algumas dessas diferenças, elas são inerentes às diferentes populações, né? Então, população com síndrome de Down, população com é, doença de Alzheimer autossômica dominante, e, ou também representam diversidade, né? As diferenças nas populações, os idiomas, além de refletir a disponibilidade de instrumentos psicométricos validados nesses países. Mas a gente vai fazer um esforço para maximizar a correspondência de instrumentos cognitivos, biomarcadores e técnicas entre as Cortes, né? é, no entanto, também é importante lembrar que diferentes estudos de variabilidade cognitiva na população geral observaram é, resultados semelhantes, aplicando é, testes cognitivos semelhantes, mas não necessariamente idênticos, né? e, e essa pode ser uma das vantagens da variabilidade cognitiva, por considerar a variabilidade de performance daquele participante, né, daquele indivíduo específico, ela não depende de medidas é, médias populacionais, né, e, e, e pode ser, então, detectável usando diferentes instrumentos. Bom, por fim, gostaria de destacar aqui que eu tenho diversas pessoas e organizações que fizeram parte do meu percurso e sem as quais, certamente, esse projeto não, não estaria acontecendo. Então, a todos estes, fica aqui o meu, o meu agradecimento. Obrigada. Professor Orestes, acho que está no mudo para nós aqui, então a gente não está escutando, desculpa. Só estava agradecendo, dando os parabéns, e dizendo que você está escalando para uma próxima edição do workshop, para a gente voltar para o seu estudo.
sempre que você assim, nos ajudou muito também, na medida que os dados que você coletou na corte da PAI, da população que você avaliou na PAI, que foi depois incorporada na nossa casuística, acabou gerando um baseline, uma avaliação de base, que nos ajuda muito a identificar a mudança né, do, do declínio cognitivo na transição demencial. Muito obrigado. É, eu tenho agora o prazer de convidar Matheus Aranha. Matheus Aranha é radiologista aqui da casa, formado aqui pela casa, onde ele iniciou o doutorado, está fazendo agora dupla titulação em Barcelona, e se não me engano, o orientador é o Juan Fortea, ou trabalha em, em associação muito próxima com o Juan Fortea, que é uma das lideranças dessa área de biomarcadores é, na Centro de Dá. Matheus, a aula é sua. First of all, uh, hi everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizing committee for, for this invitation. It's actually a great uh, personal uh, pleasure and honor to be back home, even though if it's like uh, virtually. And it's actually, it's also an honor to share uh, this panel with uh, such great scientists in the field. Uh, I cannot stress enough uh, the importance of discussing Down syndrome as a model uh, for studying Alzheimer's disease and its related biomarkers, including neuroimaging biomarkers, which is my, my field of, of work. In fact, uh, Down syndrome is probably the best model for studying Alzheimer's disease, and this is for several reasons. Uh, the first of them is that Down syndrome associated Alzheimer's disease, uh, as uh, said before, is a genetic form of AD. It's probably not a surprise to anyone in the audience uh, that uh, Down syndrome is caused by uh, the trisomy of the chromosome 21. Uh, and the triplication of this chromosome leads to an extra copy of the APP gene increasing the amount of APP protein uh, in the neuronal membrane. APP gene triplication is both uh, necessary and sufficient uh, to cause Alzheimer's disease pathology in people with Down syndrome. We know from case reports uh, that people with a trisomy of the chromosome 21, but without uh, the APP gene triplication, do not have a higher risk of developing AD pathology uh, than the general population. On the other hand, patients with isolated triplication of the ATP gene do not have uh, Down syndrome phenotype, but do present AD pathology. So currently, uh, DS-associated AD is considered a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and people with Down syndrome are at ultra high risk of developing dementia. The characteristic neuropathological findings in DSAD uh, or Down syndrome associated AD, including beta amyloid plaques uh, and neurofibrillary tangles, are strikingly similar in appearance uh, and distribution to those observed in autosomal dominant and in sporadic AD. And if pathology is, is similar, uh, then the biomarker changes are also similar. CSF analysis uh, shows a reduction in 50% of the levels of A-beta-42 and an increase uh, of 100% in the levels of phosphorylated tau in Down syndrome patients uh, with symptomatic AD when compared to opioid controls and to asymptomatic uh, people with Down syndrome. As for the neuroimaging biomarkers, uh, amyloid, and tau deposition, as well as glucose uh, hypometabolism and cortical atrophy happens in an overwhelming similar pattern uh, to those observed uh, in sporadic and autosomal dominant AD. Not only the chemical changes in the topology of the neuroimaging findings, uh, but also the temporality of biomarker changes are nearly the same. Uh, our group uh, has shown that the trajectories of the amyloid biomarkers, the tau biomarkers, uh, neurodegeneration, and clinical symptoms are strikingly similar in Down syndrome-related and autosomal dominant AD. In fact, uh, this is what we see with uh, neuroimaging. Um, cortical amyloid deposition uh, detected by amyloid PET increases after the age of 40 uh, or around
around 10 years before uh, the age of symptoms onset, as we can see uh, in the panel on the left in the graph. On the images uh, on the right, we see a negative amyloid pet uh, with the normal tracer uptake uh, in the white matter, but no uptake uh, in the cortex. When PET becomes positive, we will observe a cortical tracer uptake, indicating then a cortical A-beta pathology. This is what we expected in, in people with Down syndrome um, after the age of 40. Uh, the tau PET positivity comes a bit later, uh, which is closer to the age of onset, as we can see by the, by the green line uh, uh, in, the, in the graph on the, on the left. A normal scan uh, shown on the right uh, shows no parenchyma or parenchymal uptake. This is what we expect. Uh, but around the age of the symptoms onset, we start seeing cortical uptake in typical uh, AD-related regions, such as the precuneus, uh, the posterior cingulate, and the temporoparietal uh, regions. And these are the same regions where we should expect reduced uh, glucose hypometabolism um, detected by FDG PET and indicating neurodegeneration. On the right panel, we see a normal metabolic pattern. Uh, when neurodegeneration becomes detectable, what we see is a reduction on the FDG uh, uptake, uh, also on precuneus, posterior cingulate, and temporoparietal region. Another biomarker of neurodegeneration uh, in Alzheimer's disease is the hypocompolatrophy. Uh, this marker uh, is less sensitive than the hypometabolism and uh, detected by FDG PET and can also be observed in other uh, neurodegenerative diseases as well, and not only in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, also, Alzheimer's disease has a near full penetrance uh, in Down syndrome. Macaro and colleagues have followed people with Down syndrome for over 20 years. Uh, this long-term uh, follow-up study has shown that AD dementia affects nearly 100% of participants that are older than uh, 65 years old, showing that AD has near full penetrance uh, in population with DS. Another important reason to, to study DSAD is that Alzheimer's disease limits the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome. Uh, this study uh, from Vitals and Glassen uh, showed how the life expectancy of the general population and people with Down syndrome changed uh, in the 20th century. Uh, it, the straight lines here uh, show an steady increase in the life expectancy uh, of people of the general population while the full line uh, shows how the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome has grown exponentially. Uh, the great increase in the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome in the past decades uh, is owed uh, to improvements in the healthcare for this population, uh, most notably uh, in cardiac surgery. By seeing this data, it's quite tempting to assume that the people with Down syndrome will live as long as the general population in the very near future. But this might not be exactly true. Uh, CDC mortality data in Down syndrome shows uh, that the age uh, death uh, has increased over, over the past 50 years, reaching a plateau in the past decade. Currently, uh, around 50% of people with Down syndrome uh, die just before age 60, while 90% die before age 70 which is about 20 years earlier than the general population. Uh, this study provides data uh, to suggest that this limit in the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome is actually imposed uh, by Alzheimer's disease, and that this population will not live as long as the general population until uh, effective AD therapies uh, evolve. This meta-analysis uh, was led by Florencia Yulita from Dr. Cortea's group, uh, and has shown that uh, Down syndrome-related AD uh, is just as predictable as autosomal dominant AD. And for many years, uh, the common assumption has been that the age at onset of dementia in Down syndrome was highly variable, 
uh, in contrast with the autosomal dominant forms uh, in which uh, at the age at onset is considered relatively constant within each uh, gene mutation, genetic mutation. But our group has shown that the variability uh, at the age of clinical onset, uh, symptom onset uh, in the S and in a DAD is actually the same. The idea that the age at onset, uh, the age of uh, symptoms onset, I'm sorry, uh, in Down syndrome is more variable uh, than in a DAD is likely related to the difficulties involved in the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome. Uh, in this population, uh, the, in the initial symptoms of dementia are often mistake, mistaken as uh, the base of intellectual disability, making the diagnosis quite challenging. However, uh, this meta-analysis uh, showed that the age at onset was consistent across the studies in the literature, with a similar variability in Down syndrome as in autosomal dominant forms. So uh, long story short, uh, Down syndrome-related AD uh, is just like autosomal dominant AD, but with some uh, peculiarities. The first of them is that people with Down syndrome have some neuroanatomical differences compared to the opioid controls uh, or opioid population. Uh, People with Down syndrome present what we call brachycephaly, which is uh, a shorter uh, diameter in the anterior posterior uh, direction, uh, simplified general appearance, and smaller overall brain volume. More specifically, what we observe is uh, a smaller frontal and parietal lobes, smaller cerebellum, uh, smaller hypocampi and amygdala as well. Uh, a larger parahippocampal gyri and normal sized uh, basal ganglia. These neuroanatomical differences have direct influence in morphometric studies involving uh, Down syndrome participants. We know from neuroanatomical studies that the hippocampi and the total brain volume are smaller uh, in Down syndrome uh, than in the general population. However, uh, when we adjust the hypocampal volume uh, on the left for um, this panel that we, you see on, on the slide, when we adjust the hypocampal volume uh, for the total intracranial volume using a simple proportion, which is dividing uh, the hypocampal volume by the brain volume or the total intracranial volume, we noticed that the Down syndrome subjects and the controls have equal hypocampal volume before age 40. This happens because uh, we did not take into account the neuroanatomical differences between these two populations. And uh, we overestimate uh, the size of the hippocampus in Down syndrome because we are actually dividing um, a volume of one structure by a smaller uh, coefficient. So when we use a proper method that considers neuroanatomical differences between two populations for adjusting hypocampal volume for total intracranial volume, we get results that are actually concordant for, uh, with uh, what we observe uh, in neuroanatomical studies. Also, some characteristics of Down syndrome offer a great opportunity to ask specific scientific questions. For instance, uh, we know that people with Down syndrome have lower risk factors uh, such as hypertension, uh, vascular risk, risk factors, sorry, such as hypertension and atherosclerosis. Uh, this makes Down syndrome an excellent model for studying um, the intersection between Alzheimer's disease and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, for example, our group and others uh, have found that even in the lack of classic vascular risk factors, people with Down syndrome have a higher burden of white matter flare hyperintensities than uh, observed uh, in opioid controls and early onset Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that these MRI findings uh, might be related to AD pathology and not only uh, to cerebrovascular disease as previously thought. 
Uh, also, a higher prevalence of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, according to the modified Boston criteria, has been observed in Down syndrome uh, compared to, eupl to euploid controls uh, and sporadic AD. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy is characterized by justocortical and infratentorial microbleeds uh, and superficial siderosis, as you can see on panels A, uh, B, and C as these uh, really dark uh, dots. Sometimes uh, these microbleeds, uh, they can be accompanied by uh, signal abnormalities uh, in flare. So you can see the microbleeds on the upper row, on the upper panel, and these abnormalities uh, on flare uh, intensity uh, on the lower panel. Uh, and this finding requires uh, some attention since we might be facing a case of CAA related inflammation. Actually, neuroradiologists must be aware of these findings because uh, they are often mistaken for white matter hyperintensities related to vascular gliosis. Uh, when they are, in fact, inflammatory uh, edema. Uh, in this case specifically, uh, you, can, you can see that the findings are very, very subtle. Please note uh, that the edema uh, is affecting not only the subcortical white matter, as we can see uh, here, but also uh, the cortex. And uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, interpret this as a uh, gliosis related to vascular change. But when we see the follow-up, uh, we see a massive uh, inflammatory abnormality showing that what we saw previously was actually inflammation and not gliosis. Another peculiarity uh, is the relatively high prevalence of epilepsy and sleep disorders in Down syndrome that makes uh, uh, Down syndrome a great model for understanding how these entities uh, interact with Alzheimer's disease and modify the clinical presentations of AD. <coughs> Epilepsy uh, is common in Down syndrome. It has a bimodal distribution with one peak in the early childhood and another after the age of 40. Uh, and the late presentation, which, is, uh, which happens around the sixth decade of life, is closely related to symptomatic AD. As for sleep disorders, a study led by Sandra Jimenez uh, showed that, the Down syndrome, uh, that in Down syndrome, the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is around 80% uh, against only 14% in the general population. Uh, they also have lower sleep efficiency and less uh, REM sleep uh, compared to controls. These sleep abnormalities uh, might accelerate the progression to AD dementia. Another great advantage is that Down syndrome is much more prevalent uh, than autosomal dominant AD. While the estimated number of people living with ADAD is around 250,000 people worldwide, the total number of people with Down syndrome is actually estimated in 6 million. This uh, relatively high prevalence of Down syndrome makes it feasible to build study cohorts basically anywhere. <coughs> Another important advantage is that Down syndrome related AD uh, is the only model to study the natural history of AD neuropathology. Uh, this is because people with Down syndrome die earlier from other causes and a relatively large amount of uh, neuropathological data uh, across the entire lifespan is actually available. We know from neuropathological studies um, that the amyloid cascade is a process that happens over decades and follows a predictable sequence of events. In Down syndrome, a beta pathology in the form of intraneuronal uh, deposits, deposits uh, starts early in the childhood. While the deposition of diffuse uh, a beta plagues in the brain starts uh, in teenagers. A beta pathology happens uh, many years uh, before CSF or PET changes can be detected. Uh, a beta plates are then followed by the formation of uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And between the age 40 to 45 years, people with Down syndrome have 
uh, what we call we call full blown AD pathology. And after 10 to 15 years, uh, by the age of 60, nearly all of them will present uh, dementia symptoms. And last but not least, uh, Down syndrome is the perfect population uh, for preventive clinical trials, as mentioned before. Uh, the predictability of pathological events uh, in Down syndrome-related Alzheimer's disease offers not only a great opportunity for studying the natural history of AD neuropathology, but also uh, for identifying potential points for preventive and therapeutic interventions. Uh, this makes people with Down syndrome the perfect population for primary and for secondary uh, clinical uh, prevention clinical trials. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and I'm open for any questions that might, might you might have now or that you that might come up in the future. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much Martin, for this really presentation. And we're going to take questions at the end of the session. Uh, just a second. Okay. And I was wondering if I to introduce Professor Heinrich Zetterberg from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, you're a professor of psychiatry and neurochemistry. That's right, uh, Henrik. And uh, Henrik is also one of the leading experts in the world in the field of uh, Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. It's important he has an impressive record of over 2,000 publications in this field. So, I think it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great introduction, Orestes, and also sorry for not being there in, in person with you. I have truly enjoyed uh, the previous talks, and uh, you will see that my presentation will describe some of the uh, similar lines of thinking that, that we have heard from both Matthias and, and uh, Luciana. Uh, so I often start presentations with this type of slide, which summarizes the available uh, biomarkers that we have now for Alzheimer's disease-related pathophysiological processes. Uh, the ones that are now in uh, red boxes here, they are the ones that we can measure in biofluids. And we have a beta 40 to 40 ratio in CSF and plasma that reflects amyloid buildup in plaques. We have phosphorylated tau, which seems to represent some type of neuronal reaction to amyloid. So neurons that are exposed to amyloid plaque pathology will react to that pathology by phosphorylating and secreting tau. And then cerebrospinal fluid and plasma phosphorylated tau levels will increase. And then we have neurofilament light as a fluid a biomarker for neuroaxonal degeneration irrespective of underlying cause. And it's been shown in many different studies that across the neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease in Down's syndrome, CSF and plasma levels of neurofilament light marks onset of neurodegeneration in this disease. And then we have a newcomer in the field, or it's not a newcomer, it has been known for a while, but it's a protein called glial fibrillary acidic protein, which is an astrocytic marker that is also secreted from astrocytes when they are activated. And this protein can be measured in both CSF and plasma and increases strongly when amyloid plaques start to form in the brain. These types of biomarkers have been studied in relation to amyloid PET and tau PET and MRI evidence of neurodegeneration in uh, both cross-sectional and longitudinal cohort studies, mainly focusing on Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's disease continuum from, from preclinical Alzheimer's disease to, uh, to, to um, mildly symptomatic Alzheimer's disease to the dementia stage. But I will now detail to you what has been done so far in the field of Down's syndrome. So if we start with the phosphorylated tau biomarkers in Down's syndrome, they can now be measured with reliable assays in plasma. So a simple blood uh, sample is needed. Uh, there is no need virtually for a cerebrospinal fluid sampling, which is a, uh, that, that is a relatively large or big advantage compared to uh, what we had access to just five, five six years ago. Uh, so we now can measure plasma phosphorylated tau. This is a study by Alberto Leo in co collaboration.
collaboration with my team, where we have control individuals to the left and plasma phosphatar concentrations on the on the y-axis. Uh, people with Down syndrome who are cognitively intact, uh, very similar to that, to control individuals, and then we have people who, uh, Down people who start to to get cognitive symptoms and eventually develop dementia. And you see how phosphorylated tau levels increase like this. And it's a two to three fold increase um, if you look at group level data. Uh, and actually, the, there is it's it's almost diagnostically useful here if one looks at the people who are uh, uh, one can almost draw a line here, which gives you a very nice sensitivity and specificity. Um, this is a study from Oscar Hansson's team where another phosphor form of tau was used. This was phosphor tau one eighty one, which is the most common phosphorylated tau form that increases in response to amyloid pathology and Alzheimer's disease. And here we have phosphorylated tau 217. And this is probably the most specific marker for Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology uh, in response to amyloid. And here you see amyloid negative siblings and amyloid negative down individuals. They are similar. But then you see to, to the... Oops. Uh, there we go. I'll hide this. So that I see. There. Uh, there you see that the amyloid positive down individuals, they have increased levels like this. So amyloid deposition in Alzheimer's disease, as well as in Alzheimer's disease in down individuals, results in increased plasma levels of phosphor tau, which is a bio um, uh, a pathophysiological process indicating that neurons are exposed to amyloid plaque pathology. They react to this pathology by phosphorylating and secreting tau. And now you hear a little bit of a peculiar aspect of tau in blood, and that is that tau levels in blood are more markers of amyloid um, plaque pathology in the brain than tau tangle pathology. And the way we think about this now in the biomarker field is that phosphorylated tau levels in biofluids uh, indicate that neurons are impaired by amyloid. These neurons will eventually develop tangle pathology because of all of the mobilized tau uh, from phosphorylation of tau in the microtubuli in, in, in the axons. And this tau can eventually aggregate and form tangles when the lysosomal system and the secretion system in the neurons are overwhelmed. So plasma phosphorylated tau levels are direct markers of amyloid exposure of neurons and predictive markers of tangle pathology. And that's why we think they are so important in these types of cohort studies. In this slide, I show you a new uh, phospho tau biomarker of particular relevance to Down syndrome. And this is tau phosphorylated at amino acid 212. And the reason for why I would like to highlight this particular tau biomarker is that this phosphorylation at amino acid 212 is um, uh, that phosphorylation is made by a kinase called DERK one a and the, the gene for this kinase is on chromosome 21. So here we actually have a situation where neurons will be a little bit prepared for phosphorylation at this particular amino acid because of an increased gene dose of DERK1A. Uh, and here are data from also down individuals. To the left you see asymptomatic down individuals who are cognitively normal. And then you see in yellow in the middle down individuals with some cognitive disturbance that is progressive, and then you see down individuals who are demented. And the left part here in both slides, in, in all these groups, represent plasma levels, and the dashed lines are CSF levels. And you see that there is a relatively strong increase in 217, uh, 212 levels uh, of phosphorylated tau, and that happens rapidly in patients with uh, amyloid pathology who start to get symptoms from Alzheimer's disease. And then there is not much increase like this. Uh, here we can compare it to what it looks like in in uh, a cohort with um, Alzheimer's, sporadic Alzheimer's disease instead. Here you see control levels, and then you see that plasma levels increase a little bit, but the, the CSF increase is higher. It, 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 in down, it looks like the increase happens very rapidly, and that the, the levels are comparable in uh, plasma and uh, CSF. 
In the B panel, you see phosphorylated tau to 181 levels. And the fold change is a little bit smaller compared with 212. So we hope that this uh, biomarker could give some additional information than uh, 181 and perhaps also other fossil forms in, in um, uh, down um, individuals with Alzheimer's disease pathology. And there are also some attempts to develop or evaluate DERK 1A inhibitors to try to inhibit this type of phosphorylation and thereby see if there is a possibility of making the neurons more resistant to amyloid pathology. But this is a hypothesis, of course. Uh, here you see the, the diagnostic performance, and basically what one can say uh, here is um, uh, asymptomatic down individuals versus, versus down individuals with dementia. Most of these phosphatal markers perform really well, actually. So, so we are in a good place in regards to uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease in down, and the plasma biomarkers work really well. well. Here you see what it looks like in, in uh, an a sporadic Alzheimer's disease cohort, where uh, it looks like CSF levels are a little bit better than the plasma levels. But in down, there is actually no big difference. Then we have another uh, protein which is attracting a lot of interest in Alzheimer's disease and is also very valuable in uh, in uh, downs, and that is glial, fibrillary acidic protein, uh, which is a biomarker of astrogliosis or astrocytic activation. And astrocytes react very rapidly to amyloid pathology, and it's a concerted reaction that happens in networks of astrocytes. And therefore, we think that uh, this protein is particularly interesting in regard to detecting um, astrocytic activation in response to amyloid. Uh, here we can look at what, what it looks like in, in uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Here are young people who are uh, perhaps in their 40s and 50s um, uh, in this sporadic Alzheimer's disease study. And here we have cognitively unimpaired amyloid PET negative people. There is a little bit of an age-related increase. And then we have cognitively unimpaired people who are amyloid PET positive, and then people with MCI, mild cognitive impairment with amyloid PET positivity, and then Alzheimer's disease, dementia patients. These are patients with other forms of dementias where the levels are almost indistinguishable from uh, cognitively unimpaired controls who are age matched. So this looks like an amyloid response marker, and it works in blood. In CSF, the increase is not as clear. There is a, uh, an increase, but it's not as clear. And I will come back to why the CSF test does um, actually works a little bit worse. The AUCs are around 0.8 to detect amyloid uh, positivity by CSF and beta 42 40 ratio or amyloid PET. Um, so it's not a superb diagnostic marker, but it's really interesting if one would like to examine the role of astrocytes in this process. Um, so with Sang Pao memory unit, we have done a study, a relatively large study of down individuals. And then we have uh, also a sporadic Alzheimer's disease arm in this study. And we measured quite a number of different biomarkers. And this is what it looks like. So here we have asymptomatic down individuals. And here we have down individuals with some progressive cognitive deterioration. And here you see that plasma GFAP increase is really clear. There is an overlap, of course, as there is for, for many uh, biomarkers, but uh, group level data are super clear. And then here you have down individuals who are um, who have dementia. Uh, and if one compares this to the sporadic Alzheimer's disease control, it looks really similar. But perhaps the increases are a little bit more pronounced and clear in down. Uh, if one compares with uh, neurofilament light, which is a general marker of neurodegeneration, uh, you see that the results are super clear in down, uh, whereas they are a little bit less clear in the sporadic Alzheimer's disease cohort. And that is because in older people, NFL is a more noisy biomarker. It reacts to cerebrovascular disease. It also reacts to, uh, there is a clear age-related increase of NFL, which happens more clearly than GFAP. So that's that's um, uh, re relatively clear here. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. This was actually neurofilament light in both these. These are plasma NFL and uh, CSF NFL. And then we have phosphorylated tau in CSF, uh, in, in down and also in, in um, uh, the sporadic Alzheimer's disease cohort. And here you see how well uh, the phosphorylated uh, 
how increases in uh, also in down uh, down individuals with Alzheimer's disease uh, even clearer than what it is in like uh, what it is in, um, in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Here we have the CSF results, and one can see here that there is an age-related increase, but not at all as clear in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And if one compares with CSF NFL levels in uh, Down syndrome, it increases clearly, and it's not as clear in, in the uh, Alzheimer's disease cohort, again, because of this age-related increase in neurofilament light. Uh, but in Down, you don't have this type of age-related problem to, to some extent, of course, uh, since these groups with cognitive deterioration often are a little bit older. But that's an inherent problem of Down uh, studies where Alzheimer's disease is the, is the topic. And here is CSF phosphotau increases in Down individuals and in uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease uh, individuals. And here you see that the patterns are really comparable. If one looks at the diagnostic accuracy of the plasma biomarkers uh, in down to detect uh, pro uh, cognitive deterioration and dementia in down individuals, plasma GFAP performs really well with an AUC of 0.93. Plasma NFL is not much worse, uh, an AUC of around 0.9, and plasma phosphotau also around 0.9. Uh, if one instead looks in the sporadic Alzheimer's disease cohort, you see in general that that, that um, uh, NFL and phosphotau biomarkers have a little bit of a lower diagnostic performance, whereas GFAP performs really well in this cohort. <coughs> if one would look at uh, if the prognostic uh, information carried by plasma GFAP levels. Uh, one can then group uh, individuals uh, according to whether or not they are progressing over time. And all, if you look at asymptomatic down individuals who are progressing uh, during follow-up, then you see that that latter group will have increased levels. And there is a little bit of such a difference here as well. Here we just have dementia people and there we don't have the longitudinal progression data. Uh, so, uh, if you are in the higher uh, tertile of, of um, uh, plasma GFAP concentrations, uh, the progression towards dementia is much higher. And again, one would like to use this in clinical trials and treat the down individuals to normalize the GFAP levels, neutralize the effects of amyloid, for example, and then uh, hopefully that will uh, give less uh, progression to, to dementia. And this should then be predicted by the plasma GFAP biomarker. Here are longitudinal trajectories of plasma GFAP. And you can see that the biomarker is relatively um, stable over time in uh, Down syndrome. There are some people who increase, and we don't know exactly what that means because it happens in most, most groups. But in general, you can see that most people who are not having a progression towards cognitive deterioration or dementia, they are stable. And then you see that people who are progressing, they have a little bit higher levels and perhaps a little bit of a higher slope in their uh, longitudinal uh, plasma GFAP concentration. Um, here, we don't have many data points to look at, but these are individuals who are uh, progressing and they have a clear upward slope in their longitudinal uh, plasma GFAP trajectory, uh, which is very similar to the trajectory we see for plasma GFAP in in uh, in uh, down individuals who are oops who are um, uh, uh, already symptomatic. And there is a correlation between plasma GFAP levels and um, uh, different imaging measures. So the higher the plasma GFAP concentration, the lower the cortical thick thickness, and the lower the the, the uh, cerebral metabolism and the higher the amyloid PET uptake. That it's a relatively clear pattern, actually. Um, if we instead compare and focus on amyloid, we can group people uh, with down or without down, uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic, according to their amyloid PET positivity status. And you see that most of the difference is carried. Or, or explained by amyloid PET positivity. So the plasma GFAP increase is driven by amyloid uh, pathology in the brain, it seems like. Uh, and here's the CSF. Uh, here, here instead, we used CSF amyloid positivity with a similar result, but perhaps a little bit less clear.
The different biomarkers in down correlate with each other. Uh, uh, the strongest correlations are seen between plasma GFAP and NFL. Um, and uh, there is also some uh, correlation here between plasma GFAP and uh, amyloid PET uh, status. But you see that many of these biomarkers correlate. Um, the negative correlations are uh, explained by uh, CSFA beta 42 40 ratio, which goes in the opposite direction if there is amyloid uh, pathology in the brain. So here you see that all of the correlations are negative for CSFA beta 42 40 ratio with all of the other biomarkers. Mm -hmm. So one could think about using uh, these blood tests, of course, in medical care to diagnose onset of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down. And when I say onset of Alzheimer's disease, I mean onset of Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain. And then I could also perhaps make some prognostic estimations uh, using blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease pathology. In clinical trials, uh, these markers could, of course, be used to enroll participants. They could be used uh, as pre-screening tools to detect people who are very likely to be, for example, amyloid PET positive, if that is what you're looking for. Uh, it could also be uh, used uh, by themselves. For example, if one had um, wanted to um, test if a drug could lower plasma phosphatau levels um, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, it could be good to have as an inclusion criterion that most of the subjects included should have increased plasma phosphatau levels. Um, this is something which is used a lot in sporadic Alzheimer's disease studies. Blood biomarkers as a screening tool for amyloid um, PET <laughs> before the PET uh, examination is done. Then, of course, when we have good treatments against Alzheimer's disease, these blood biomarkers would be useful to monitor treatment effects. Uh, an effective detoxifying agent against amyloid pathology should lower plasma phosphatau levels. And that lowering should happen uh, perhaps within three to six uh, months, or uh, at least six to 12 months, I would predict. Uh, and the uh, we don't know this yet, but likely the the, uh, the greater the normalization of this plasma biomarker, the better effect of the drug. But that has not been proven yet, uh, not in the Lecanemab uh, trials either. Uh, we could also replace some of the CSF examinations with plasma, of course. Uh, and hopefully we could uh, perhaps also reduce the need of doing a lot of PET examinations in people. Uh, there are other things we need to examine further. Uh, what are the relationships with non-amyloid pathology since we now have seen so strong relationships with amyloid pathology? And then uh, we, we do not know for sure if uh, GFAP really is an astrocytic marker, if it's astrocytic activation, astrogliosis or a combination. Um, we have been puzzled a bit by the diagnostic performance of plasma GFAP compared with cerebrospinal fluid GFAP. But we have recently been able to show that CSF is not a good matrix in which to measure GFAP. Uh, after a few free store cycles, you lose uh, the protein a lot, whereas the protein is stable in blood. There is no such difference for neurofilament light. So we think that this is a really uh, sensitive marker in cerebrospinal fluid and unstable. And this I think I skip here. Um, uh, this is also what you have seen from uh, some of the earlier uh, talks here. But there is an evolution of biomarkers in Down syndrome, and it looks like uh, the, the CSF amyloid uh, changes very early in, in uh, Down syndrome, of course, immediately when amyloid is starting to accumulate. And that is then followed by GFAP and the different phosphatau forms in both uh, plasma and CSF, whereas with the caveat that G is, GFAP is not a good uh, marker in cerebrospinal fluid because of some type of matrix effect by CSF. So with this, I would like to close uh, this talk, and I'm very happy to take questions to, during the discussion. And I uh, thank you for inviting me to, to give this talk and also to uh, take part uh, with the other presenters in, in this uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Well, uh, may I start with one more first question, Eric? Well, uh, very interesting data about uh, social related tau but from what you didn't say, I assume you're not an enthusiast of amyloid plasma. Is that right? 
Yep, yeah, this is a very good way. I, perhaps I should have brought it up in my talk also. So in cerebrospinal fluid, uh, when amyloid starts to deposit in the brain, you get a, a relatively quick reduction in the A-beta 42 over 40 ratio. And that is because you have this type of selective sequestration of the 42 amino acid long, sticky form of amyloid. So it stays in the brain tissue. There are also some data indicating that microglia could help deplete A-beta-42 from the brain interstitial fluid, giving you this type of relatively strong reduction in the CSF A-beta-42-40 ratio. Um, the reduction is 50% almost. And it's like if you have um, uh, all comers to our lab and do the ratio, you will see a bimodal distribution of the ratio. People are either high or low with a relatively small overlap in this ratio. In blood, the ratio is also decreased, but only by approximately 10%, not 50. And the overlap between amyloid positive and negative groups, according to PET, uh, that overlap is much larger. And that is because most of the plasma A-beta concentrations that we are measuring are not derived from the brain. They come from blood platelets, myocytes, hepatocytes, and some other cell types in the periphery. So it, uh, this 10% reduction in the ratio gives you relatively good group-level data. But if you try to discriminate individual people according to whether or not they're depositing amyloid by a plasma maybe tough to 240 test, it's very hard. That's why we recommend plasma phosphotau as an amyloid marker. But you hear that people could get confused here when I, when I say like that. But that is simply because plasma phosphotau increases two to five fold when you have amyloid in the brain because neurons will respond to the amyloid pathology by secreting tau, phosphorylated and total tau. Uh, and then you get this type of increase, which is easier to measure in a clinical, labor uh, clinical laboratory setting. Whereas this small reduction in the A-beta 40 ratio in plasma is very hard to reliably measure week by week in a clinical lab. Thank you. That's very clear. So I will uh, open the discussion to the whole audience. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be. I'm going to be in my Okay, let's start with Luciana then, please. Uh, hi, uh, first ex excellent presentations uh, for all the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Monica Zettenberg and also uh, Dr. Aranha. Uh, I would like to to uh, place a question to Dr. Zettenberg. Uh, he he mentioned that uh, uh, plasma biomarkers uh, in Alzheimer's disease uh, and Down syndrome it's it increases more uh, clearly than. Um, for uh, sporadic disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, and you also mentioned that uh, it is probably due to less uh, noise related to advanced age, right? Uh, I was wondering if this is also the case for autosomic dominant Alzheimer's disease. And also another question that is related uh, is, uh, well, not totally related, but um, also on plasma uh, biomarkers is, uh, do you think in the future we will be, be able to use um, plasma biomarkers as uh, outcome measures in, in clinical trials? Yes, the first question regarding the biomarker pattern, it's it's very clear that um, Alzheimer's disease and Down uh, individuals um, really look super similar to Alzheimer's disease, in, in to sporadic Alzheimer's disease regarding the general pattern and the ordering of the biomarker abnormalities. But it is exactly like you said, Luciana, that, that uh, the biomarker changes are, they look clearer in Down. And that's exactly what we see in, uh, in familial or autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. So uh, I, I think that we can be really, uh, no, I shouldn't say like that. That's overemphasizing the, the value of the, the biomarkers. But when I sit in the lab and look at biomarker results, I feel like Alzheimer's disease in Down is very similar to Alzheimer's disease uh, in, in to the sporadic form of the disease and to autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. There are there are a few differences that we have seen, and one relates to phosphatau to to 12, which, I mean, it's not a big difference, but there is some theor theoretical um, explanations for why that could be a little bit of a better marker in down than in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But then we also know that, for example, a beta amyloid, which is truncated at amino acid 34, is increased. And that's because of base 2, which also sits on chromosome 21. So there are some genes on chromosome 21 
that could modulate the biomarkers a little bit, but not much. So in general, to me, it looks like uh, what down individuals face an increased risk of is a relatively traditional Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I, I would really believe that a drug that works in sporadic Alzheimer's disease will also work in downs and vice versa. I mean, you heard, I heard that you also emphasized that down could be really a population where we could evaluate uh, drugs that then might be turn out to be useful in sporadic Alzheimer's disease and vice versa, of course. Thank you. Oh, and outcome markers, you asked also. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, it's also clear that the, the more uh, strongly the blood biomarkers are changed in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, and it looks a little bit like that in Alzheimer's disease and down, the more, the faster the disease progression. And of course, we hope that we will see with one or another of the upcoming drugs that they will normalize the biomarkers and that the better normalization of the biomarkers will predict predict a better response. And if we could prove that link and really um, uh, validate these biomarkers as true surrogate markers, then I think we will be able to use them as outcome mar markers, much like the FDA already have started to, to do a little bit, but uh, that has been criticized, as you know, also. So we need really strong data supporting that use, and we need to generate it together. Thank you. Okay, next question, Monica. You can use this. Está ligado. Luciana. Acho que não está ligado. Tudo bem, Mônica? Adorei, sempre aprendo com você. Fiquei muito contente de ver a excelente apresentação num tema tão difícil. Podemos falar inglês, desculpa. Sorry, Dr. Zettenberger, again, from my Portuguese. Congratulations on all your new projects. They're amazing. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how you measure intra-individual cognitive variability. I was not sure whether you measure this variability uh, considering different cognitive domains, if uh, the variability comes uh, from comparing different tests, although they may be in one single battery. Uh, for example, are you assessing attention, executive functions, memory, and then you see variations within the tests, or if it's the exact cognitive test in different times of the day. Uh, and people vary within um, a, a specific um, period in time. Uh, I just wanted to learn a little bit more about it, and it's, it's fascinating. The results are really very promising. Thank you, Monica. Uh, excellent questions. I think I, I uh, it was a, a fast presentation, so I had no time to present uh, all the specific measures. But uh, you are right. You we are um, calculating intra-individual cognitive variability uh, both within um, domains and also across domains. Uh, with different tests. So our idea is to calculate one, uh, well, four measures of intra-individual cognitive variability. The first one is uh, uh, only uh, in memory, using memory tests, and the other one only executive function. And then uh, we will try to combine memory and executive functions since are the, the areas uh, that we, we found to decline uh, earlier during the, the progression of dementia in Down syndrome, and, uh, and also um, uh, multi-domain uh, cognitive variability. Uh, so, so it's not relevant whether they vary performance within one day? Uh, it's on, yes, it's only one day. Uh, sorry, Monica, I didn't not answer. It's only one day. So it's one day of, uh, they, they, have, they have actually um, four different uh, time points, but we are calculating uh, cross-sectional intra-individual cognitive variability. Um, we, we thought about the possibility of also calculating uh, a longitudinal intra-individual cognitive variability, but it would have some noise regarding uh, decline, right? So, uh, but, but the, the idea, the, the main idea is to calculate uh, cross-sectional intra-individual cognitive variability because it's um, if it's proven to be a sensitive measure, 
then it's much more useful than having two time points because uh, I think it, uh, very often this is the problem that we have only one time point, right? And uh, and and this is the the promising um, thing regarding cognitive variability, I believe. So it's the idea of uh, uh, trying to understand if we can predict dementia with just one time point of cognitive assessment, which is uh, much less invasive and uh, and also um, uh, easily uh, to administrate in, in different places. Okay. Right. Um, we'll have another question from Luciani. Could you please take this? <laughs> Again, it's a more general question to all of you. Uh, as some of you have claimed that uh, Down syndrome has lots of uh, similarities with. Uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, and we know that some forms of uh, treatment for Alzheimer's disease actually improve the cognitive response, increase uh, neurogens, reduces astrocyte proliferation. So do you think that uh, by doing some sort of treatment, like let's say deep brain stimulation, uh, you could revert your signs of um, um, GFAP and plasma or um, tau, phosphorylated tau protein. What I, I wouldn't know if Mateus also think uh, similar to Henrik and vice versa. Yes, I, I could just start by mentioning that I definitely think we should, in all these studies, measure these plasma biomarkers to, to see what, what happens to them and how changes treatment-induced changes relate to um, cognition and, and other um, more clinical outcome uh, measures. So I, I wouldn't dare to predict, but I think we should make use of these blood tests since they are so easy now to, to collect uh, and use them in the clinical trials, just like you you mentioned. Press Matthias has uh, also a comment on this. Well, uh, on my side, I, as I'm not an expert on fluid biomarkers, I'm on the neuroimaging lab, uh, so I, I can speak for, for neuroimaging. Uh, it's, it's true that we, we, we should expect exactly the same kind of uh, modifications related to treatment that are observed uh, in sporadic AD, for example, uh, also in Down syndrome. Um, I would only be extremely careful uh, regarding areas or uh, which is uh, amyloid related imaging abnormalities so when we have um, anti-amyloid uh, therapies uh, we are actually destroying the the plagues uh, in, in the brain uh, we are uh, the patients are more prone for uh, to bleeding and to inflammatory uh, changes and when what we've been observing, uh, we don't have actually this data in Down syndrome yet because these populations, unfortunately, uh, kept out of the current uh, um, clinical trials. But uh, as we see a higher prevalence of uh, amyloid, cerebral amyloid angiopathy uh, in this population, and we actually start seeing more and more cases of uh, actually uh, idiopathic, not, it's not idiopathic, but uh, uh, CAA-related inflammation, as I showed uh, in, in the slides, uh, we need to be extra careful uh, when including these people in clinical trials because uh, we might see actually different, uh, <laughs> the same um, reductions in the, in the beta um, amyloid tracers, uh, but we need to be extra careful extra careful for uh, events, uh, hemorrhagic and inflammatory events. Thank you. Thank you for more questions. Otherwise, I'll probably make another. And Eric, I would like to ask you, uh, what's the perspective of having in the near future uh, the universal cut of values for plasma biomarkers? Just not to go into the same problem that we got with CSF biomarkers that we had to generate in the laboratory uh, 
uh, morals to be able to examine specific individual values. Uh, yes, I, I think we will face similar problems, but I think we will solve them much much more quickly. Uh, so, uh, as Orestes, uh, what Orestes, Orestes alludes to now is also the standardization work we had to do for cerebrospinal fluid biomarker tests. Different laboratories could produce CSF tau and A beta concentrations that were with the same assays that were off uh, by you know two hundred percent or so. It was really. There were lots of details in regards to how to hand, handle the samples and exactly how to run the assays. But now, through the exercise of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, we, we have most laboratories have now started to interact and we uh, and rapidly adopt the same protocols for collecting the biomarkers and for also um, and also to, to perform the measurements and the kits that we use to measure the blood biomarkers they have gotten much better than the first generation csf tests that we had uh, so i'm hopeful that this will happen much more quickly and now also the increased interest in Alzheimer's disease as a potential um, uh, market for novel therapies have made Roche and Fujirebio and Abbott and other big clinical chemistry companies invest in this. And uh, the fully automated assays for blood um, or plasma phosphotau and A-beta concentrations that, uh, and actually neurofilament light and GFAP2 that are now emerging from Roche Diagnostics and uh, Fujirebio and some other companies like Siemens, they are much, uh, they are actually uh, performing really well. So um, it's still good with some type of competition and heterogeneity in this phase of um, biomarker development, because then we are not depending on one company, but instead there are several companies making similar assays. And then what we are doing in uh, the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine Network is to try to develop reference materials that are value assigned by reference methods. And then this means that for a certain biomarker, the, the um, uh, clinical chemistry companies need to calibrate their assays using this reference material. And hopefully this will result in um, global, um, globally comparable biomarker concentrations at, and that we also could share our reference limits and decision limits uh, across uh, laboratories and also across assays. So uh, in, in short, I think we will see in the next few years clinically validate the tests that can be run in general clinical chemistry practice. Um, and hopefully this goes hand in hand with disease modifying treatments also. So I'm hopeful that this will be um, a, a field which uh, where the biomarkers will be uh, useful to both detect um, uh, neurodegenerative changes and to monitor them in uh, companion with uh, some type of treatment. But we need to do the studies and it's very important to do them carefully also in the context of down to, to validate that the biomarkers work as we think they do. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I think that's it. So thank you, you all very much for this excellent symposium. And we thank for taking your time to, to be with us, Martinos, Luciana. Thank you, Monica, very much for joining us. Also, this is really a really closing session, and I hope to see you soon, Henry. Yes, obrigado. <laughs> <laughs>